Kian McLaughlin, at the age of 27, epitomized the spirit of adventure and the love for the great outdoors. Hailing from Dublin, Ireland, Kian found his second home amidst the rugged beauty of Jackson, Wyoming. Here, he embraced the dual life of a snowboard instructor by winter and a bar worker by summer, thriving in the seasonal rhythms of this picturesque locale. Kian's zest for life and nature was infectious, mirrored in his own eagerness to explore, to meet new people, and to push the boundaries of his own experiences. On June 8th of 2021, Kian set out for what was supposed to be a routine solo hike in the breathtaking expanse of the Grand Teton National Park, a place as renowned for its stunning vistas as it is respected for its untamed wilderness. However, this hike would lead to a mystery that captured the hearts and minds of all who knew him. Kian's failure to return marked the beginning of a deep and unsettling mystery, plunging friends, family, and the wider community into a state of shock and concern. The vibrant young man, known for his friendly demeanor and robust outdoor skills, vanished without a trace, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions and a palpable sense of urgency among those desperate to find him. Kian McLaughlin wasn't just an ordinary young man. His life was full of rich experiences and deep connections woven from both sides of the Atlantic. Born in Dublin, Ireland, Kean carried within him a vibrant culture of his homeland, yet he was equally rooted in the American experience, thanks to his dual citizenship. This unique blend of identities shaped him into a person who was as comfortable in the bustling streets of Dublin as he was on the serene, snow-capped slopes of Wyoming. Wyoming offered Kean a canvas as vast and open as his ambitions. As a snowboard instructor, he found joy in gliding down the slopes, his days marked by the exhilarating rush of cold air and the sight of fresh snow underfoot. But Kean's love for the outdoors was not confined to winter months. Hiking through the rugged terrains of Grand Teton National Park, he sought adventure in the wilderness, each new trail a chapter in his ongoing exploration of the natural world. Kean's life in Wyoming was more than just a thrill of outdoor sports. It was also about the connections he forged. With a personality that radiated warmth and genuine interest in those around him, Kean became a beloved figure in both his professional and personal circles. Friends from Ireland and the U.S. cherished his companionship, remembering him for his easy laugh, his willingness to listen, and his knack for making every conversation memorable. Before his disappearance, Cian's plans were as simple as they were reflective of his love for nature, a solo hike in the breathtaking expanse of Grand Teton. It was an activity he had undertaken many times before, yet this time it would lead to an outcome that none could have anticipated. The mystery of what happened on that trail remains, but the essence of who Cian was, a man of adventure, camaraderie, and boundless spirit, remains remembered in the hearts of those who knew him. On a day like any other, under the clear blue skies of early June, Cian McLaughlin set out alone to embrace the park. It was a place that promised solitude and adventure, a sanctuary where nature's beauty was as overwhelming as it was serene. His plan was simple, a day hike, an escape into the wild that had become a ritual, a way to reconnect with the earth beneath his feet and the sky above. This hike, however, would unfold into a narrative far removed from the ordinary, marking the beginning of a profound mystery that would captivate all who heard it. As the hours turned into days without any sign of seeing, concern quickly mounted. His absence was out of character, a puzzle that those close to him couldn't piece together. When he failed to show up for work, alarm bells rang. Seeing was known for his reliability, his punctuality, and his unwavering commitment to his job. His sudden silence and his unexplained absence spoke volumes. It was then that the reality of the situation sank in. Cian McLaughlin had vanished. The initial search effort sprang from a place of urgency and hope. Teams fanned out across the park, calling his name, hoping for a response. The rugged terrain of the Tetons, with its vast forests, steep slopes, and hidden valleys, became the focus of an intensive search operation. Park rangers, volunteers, and search dogs combed the area, looking for any clue, any sign of seeing. Helicopters buzzed overhead, their eyes scanning the ground below. 
Each day that passed without a trace of him deepened the mystery, fueling both the determination of the searchers and the growing fear that the wilderness he loved might have claimed him. The search for C.N. McLaughlin evolved into an extensive operation that tapped into a broad arsenal of resources and expertise. Park rangers, alongside a committed group of volunteers, initiated a thorough combing of Grand Teton National Park. Dogs trained to track human scent traversed the rugged landscape, their noses diligently working, while helicopters roared overhead, breaking the natural silence. These helicopters weren't just eyes in the sky. They were equipped with infrared technology designed to detect heat signatures, a beacon of hope in locating Cien against the vast, wild backdrop. Yet, the search was far from straightforward. The beauty of Grand Teton National Park are at odds with the challenges that its terrain presents. In the spring, the park transforms, a period of rebirth that also ushers in a phase of unpredictability. Snowmelt accelerates, feeding into rivers and creating a landscape that is constantly changing. Ice lurks beneath the surface, a treacherous layer hidden from view. This was the setting of the search for Sien, a place where every step could lead to discovery or danger. These conditions compounded the difficulties faced by the search teams. The melting snow and ice not only made the terrain hazardous, but also obscured trails and potential clues to Sien's whereabouts. As each day passed, the melting snow reshaped the landscape, potentially erasing paths taken or signs left behind. The natural beauty of the Tetons, with its sprawling vistas and hidden valleys, became a daunting labyrinth in the quest to find Sien, a reminder of nature's power to both awe and challenge those who venture into its domain. The disappearance of Sien McLaughlin reverberated deeply within his family, casting a shadow of profound worry and heartache. At the heart of this emotional storm stood Sien's mother, whose determination to find her son became a beacon of hope amidst the uncertainty. Her resolve to bring Sien home was unwavering, fueled by a mother's love and the relentless desire for resolution. Her strength in the face of such adversity inspired all who joined the search, embodying a hope that refused to dim, even as the days turned into weeks without signs of Sien. In their quest for answers, Sien's families reached out to the wider community, issuing a public appeal that resonated with both locals and visitors of Grand Teton National Park. They urged anyone who had been in the park around the time of Sian's disappearance to look through their photographs, hoping that, by some stroke of fate, a clue to Sian's whereabouts might have been accidentally captured. This request, simple yet profound, tapped into a collective desire to help, mobilizing eyes and hearts across the globe in search for one man lost in the wilderness. The family's appeal transcended borders, touching the hearts of many who have never met Sian, but felt moved by the story of a young man with an infectious love for life and adventure. It was a reminder of the threads of humanity that connect us all, a call to action that spoke to the very essence of community and solidarity. In the face of the unknown, Sian's family stood resilient, their voices a testament to the enduring hope that one day Sian would be found and brought home. In the midst of the relentless search, the efforts encountered a bewildering twist. Heather Mykoski, a woman who claimed to have seen Sian on the day of his disappearance, provided a detailed account that sent ripples of hope through the hearts of the search teams and Sian's family. Her vivid description of a conversation with Sian pointed searchers towards a specific area of the park, redirecting resources and focus with a promise of a break in the case. However, this beacon of hope dimmed to darkness when it was revealed that Mykoski's sighting was fabricated, a false lead that steered the search efforts away from potential clues to Sian's actual whereabouts. The revelation of the false sighting was not just a setback, it was a significant blow to the morale of those involved in the search. Valuable time and resources had been expanded on a lead that led nowhere, all while the window of opportunity to find Sian narrowed. Mykoski faced consequences for her actions, including a ban from Grand Teton National Park and a financial penalty, but the true cost of her fabrication was measured in the precious hours lost and the emotional turmoil on Sian's family rallying for his return. In the shadows of this deception, the mystery of Sian's disappearance deepened. Other potential sightings and pieces of information surfaced, including items Sian was believed to have carried with him. 
an Apple Watch, an iPhone, gold wire rim sunglasses, a silver U-shaped pendant, and a white t-shirt. These details, while seemingly minor, held the potential to unravel the mysteries surrounding Sian's fate. The public was urged to come forward with any information, no matter how insignificant it might have seemed, in the hope that Sian could still be found. The search for truth, hindered by false leads, continued under the weight of unanswered questions and the unwavering hope for a resolution. The search for C.N. McLaughlin remains an open wound in the heart of Grand Teton National Park, a stark reminder of nature's vast and unfathomable depths. Despite the passage of time, the determination of C.N.'s family, along with the commitment of authorities, has not wavered. Their hope, though tested, persists fueled by the belief that answers are still out there, waiting to be found. This enduring quest for closure underscores a collective resolve to uncover the truth of what happened to Sian on that June day, a resolve that resonates with all who hear his story. The call to action remains as vital as ever. Anyone who might hold a piece of the puzzle, no matter how small or inconsequential it may seem, is urged to come forward. Each piece of information is a potential key, a chance to piece together Sian's last steps, and ultimately, to provide his family with the answers that they desperately seek. It is a call not just for information, but for compassion and solidarity in the face of uncertainty. This story, while deeply personal, echoes a universal reminder of the risks inherent in our explorations of the wild. It reinforces the critical importance of preparation and safety in all our outdoor activities, urging hikers and adventurers to inform others of their plans and to respect the unpredictable nature of the wilderness. For the outdoor and hiking community, Scene's disappearance serves as a lesson in the balance between the freedom of adventure and the respect and caution that the natural world demands. As the search continues, the mystery of C.N. McLaughlin's disappearance remains a somber narrative within the grand tapestry of outdoor exploration. It is a narrative that calls on us to reflect on our interactions with nature, to prioritize safety and awareness, and to remember the fragile thread that connects us to the wild and to each other. Jacob Michael Olivier, at the age of 23, found himself far from his hometown of Spring, Texas, in circumstances that baffled everyone who knew him. Known for his kindness and thoughtful nature, Jacob's life in Texas was one of recovery and hope, making his sudden disappearance in August of 2011 all the more mystifying and out of character. The setting of his vanishing was the sprawling and wild Everglades National Park in Florida. The questions began when Jacob, without any apparent reason, embarked on a long journey over a thousand miles from the comfort of his home to the unfamiliar and challenging terrain of the Florida Everglades. This vast natural reserve, known for its unique ecosystem and daunting landscapes, was far from anything Jacob was known to seek out. His arrival in Florida was unannounced and unexpected. He had no friends or family in that area, nor any known connections to the state. The purpose of his journey remains shrouded in mystery, sparking intrigue and speculation among those who sought to understand his motivations. Upon entering the Everglades, Jacob's trail went cold. His green 1998 Isuzu Ombre truck was discovered abandoned in a parking lot, a silent witness to the start of a disappearance that would captivate and haunt many. The discovery of the truck, with personal belongings still inside, marked the beginning of a search that would span the rugged expanse of the park. Yet, despite extensive efforts to locate him, no trace of Jacob could be found, deepening the mystery of his fate. Jacob's sudden decision to leave Texas, his solitary journey to the Everglades, and the puzzle of his disappearance create a narrative that is as perplexing as it is tragic. Questions abound. What drew him to the Everglades? What happened in the park that led to his disappearance? The lack of answers casts a shadow over Jacob's story, leaving family, friends, and investigators grappling with the unknown. The mysterious aspects of Jacob's disappearance, his unexpected travel, the desolate location where he was last known to be, and the absence of clear reasons for his journey continue to perplex and fascinate those who seek to unravel the truth behind his vanishing. Jacob Michael Olivier's disappearance unfolds with a sequence of eerie and puzzling events, leaving more questions than answers. 
Before vanishing, Jacob's life seemed to be on a regular path, with no hints of the strange journey he was about to undertake. His last known activities were mundane, part of his daily life in Spring, Texas. Then, without warning, he was gone. The mystery deepened when the Everglades National Park Service found Jacob's green Isuzu Hombre truck abandoned. It sat silently in the parking lot of Pine Glades Lake, an empty vessel hinting at an unsettling story of its owner's disappearance. The discovery of the truck sent shockwaves through Jacob's family. They were blindsided by the news, unable to comprehend why Jacob would travel over a thousand miles to the Everglades, a place disconnected from his life in Texas. As the authorities delved into the investigation, they uncovered CCTV footage that captured Jacob entering the park. This footage, showing Jacob driving into the Everglades alone, provided a crucial timestamp for his entry, but also deepened the mystery, marking the moment he moved beyond the reach of those who knew him. Inside the truck, investigators found items that seemed out of place. A ticket that confirmed his entry date into the park, an empty weapon case signaling the presence of a gun now missing, and other personal belongings. These items painted a confusing picture of his intentions and preparedness. The last ping from Jacob's phone came late that afternoon, off a tower within the park, suggesting he had moved further into the Everglades after parking his truck. This final signal from his phone was a critical piece of evidence, offering a fleeting connection to Jacob's movements within the vast park. It guided the search efforts, hinting at where Jacob might have ventured before disappearing completely. Together, these pieces, the abandoned truck, the CCTV footage, the items left behind, and the last phone ping compose a timeline marked by uncertainty and concern. They form the foundation of a mystery that has perplexed his family, friends, and investigators alike. The initial reaction of alarm and confusion have since given way to a relentless search for answers, driving efforts to understand what happened to Jacob after he entered the Everglades, a quest that continues to this day amidst the silence of the park's sprawling wilderness. The search for Jacob mobilized a vast and coordinated effort, weaving together the skills and resources of the Everglades National Park Service, the Civil Air Patrol, and canine units in a desperate attempt to find him. The park's rangers, accustomed to the challenges of their environment, understood the enormity of their task. They were searching for a needle in a haystack, but the haystack was the Everglades, a vast expanse of over 1.5 million acres of wetland, dense vegetation, and waterways. The search teams faced formidable obstacles. The Everglades is not only immense, but its terrain is treacherous and unwelcoming. Thick mangroves, deep waters, and the ever-present risk of encountering wildlife, from alligators to venomous snakes, made the search operation perilous. Weather conditions, too, were an adversary. The Florida heat, sudden thunderstorms, and high humidity challenged the endurance of the searchers and complicated efforts to track any signs of Jacob's movement or passage. Despite these obstacles, the search teams pressed on. Canine units attempted to trace Jacob's scent, but could only find traces of it around his truck and a limited perimeter beyond it. This led to speculation that Jacob might have left the park in another vehicle or on foot, broadening the already massive search area. The Civil Air Patrol took to the skies, hoping to spot clues from above while rangers and volunteers combed the ground below. The discovery of the empty weapon case in his truck, coupled with the final ping from his cell phone, suggested various scenarios. Did Jacob meet someone in the park? Was he planning to go off-grid, or was this trip a result of an impulse or confusion? His family and the authorities grappled with these questions, each theory guiding the search in new directions, but yielding little in the way of concrete answers. The investigation into Jacob's disappearance was a puzzle with too many missing pieces. The vastness of the Everglades, the challenges posed by the environment, and the scarcity of leads formed a complex web of obstacles that hampered efforts to uncover what happened to Jacob after he stepped into that park. With every day that passed, the mystery of his fate grew deeper, leaving more questions than answers in its wake. The disappearance of Jacob Michael Olivier cast a shadow of sorrow and uncertainty over his family, leaving them grappling with an endless sea of questions and the pain of his absence. 
Each day without answers adds to their emotional burden, a relentless mix of hope and despair. Jacob's family found themselves in a relentless quest for answers, clinging to any piece of information that might explain why Jacob traveled to the Everglades and what had happened to him there. Their lives were suspended in a state of waiting and wondering, with each unanswered question deepening their anguish. The community response to Jacob's disappearance was a testament to the bonds that tie people together in times of crisis. Friends, neighbors, and even strangers rallied around Jacob's family, offering support in various forms, from participating in search and rescue efforts to providing emotional support. The search for Jacob brought together a diverse group of individuals, each driven by a shared purpose to bring him home. This collective effort reflected the community's resilience and compassion as they joined hands with Jacob's family in their time of need. As days turned into weeks and then years, the absence of concrete answers took its toll, not only on Jacob's family, but also on the wider community. The mystery of his disappearance lingered like an open wound, a constant reminder of the fragility of life and the depths of human connection. Jacob's story transcended personal tragedy, touching the hearts of many and uniting them in a shared hope for closure and peace. The emotional impact of Jacob's disappearance on his family and the surrounding community underscores the profound ways in which a single life can touch many. It is a story of love, loss, and the enduring human spirit in the face of the unknown. In the wake of Jacob's disappearance, theories and speculations emerged, each attempting to shed light on the reasons behind his unexpected journey to the Everglades and the circumstances of his vanishing. The lack of concrete evidence and clear motives turned the case into a canvas for conjecture, with various scenarios painted by those following the case closely. One theory suggested that Jacob, Seeking adventure or a break from his routine life might have been drawn to the Everglades for his vast wilderness and isolation. Perhaps in seeking solitude or a connection with nature, Jacob underestimated the challenges and dangers of the park. This theory contemplates the possibility of an accident or getting lost in the expansive and treacherous terrain of the Everglades. Another line of speculation revolved around the mental health challenges Jacob had faced in the past. Could a desire for escape, a sudden impulse, or a bout of confusion have led him to drive across the country to such a remote and challenging environment? The discovery of an empty weapons case in his truck added a layer of complexity, suggesting preparation for a threat or, more troublingly, an intention that spoke to a deeper turmoil. The last known signal from Jacob's phone, coupled with the CCTV footage of him entering the park alone, fueled discussions about his state of mind and intentions upon arrival. Was Jacob meeting someone in the Everglades? The isolated location, far from his home and devoid of personal connections, made this theory both intriguing and perplexing. The absence of further evidence made it impossible to confirm if the trip was planned or spontaneous, or if Jacob intended to meet with fate or flee from it. Some speculated about the possibility of foul play, considering the Everglades' reputation for being a place where secrets can easily be hidden. However, without evidence of a struggle or a confrontation, this theory remained as speculative as the others. Amid these theories, the implications for the case were significant. Each hypothesis opened new avenues for investigation, but also highlighted the daunting task of searching for truth in a place as vast and impenetrable as the Everglades. The speculative nature of these theories underscores the profound mystery at the heart of Jacob's disappearance. A puzzle composed of fragmented clues, unanswered questions, and the echoing silence of the wilderness. The case of Jacob Michael Olivier remains an unsolved puzzle a story suspended in the still, silent expanse of the Everglades. Classified as endangered missing, Jacob's disappearance is a cold case that refuses to fade into obscurity. Kept alive by the tireless efforts of his family, authorities, and a community unwilling to forget. Despite the passage of years, the quest for answers continues, with each day adding to the resolve to uncover the truth behind Jacob's mysterious vanishing. In an effort to keep the case in the public eye, Jacob's family and law enforcement have made repeated appeals for information. Social media posts, flyers, and press conferences serve as a reminder of Jacob's disappearance, urging anyone with even the smallest piece of information to come forward. 
Contact details for tips are widely circulated, offering a direct line for those who might hold the key to unraveling the mystery. These efforts underscore a collective determination to find Jacob, reflecting a hope that someone, somewhere, knows something that could lead to a breakthrough. Jacob's case casts a spotlight on the broader challenges of missing persons investigations in the vast natural parks like the Everglades. It highlights the immense difficulties faced by search and rescue teams navigating these wild, often inhospitable terrains. The disappearance of a single individual in such a sprawling wilderness underscores the need for enhanced search technologies, improved coordination among agencies, and greater awareness among the public of the risks associated with these natural landscapes. Moreover, Jacob's story serves as a reminder of the countless others who have vanished without a trace in similar settings. It raises important questions about how society, law enforcement, and communities respond to such disappearances and the measures in place to prevent them. In the fate of nature's vastness and the limits of human endeavor, the continuing mystery of Jacob Michael Olivier stands as a testament to the enduring hope for resolution and the relentless search for answers in the depths of the unknown. As we reflect on the enduring mystery of Jacob's disappearance, let us also remember the power of community, the strength of hope, and the unyielding human spirit in the face of the unknown. This story, while unique in its details, is a reminder of the countless others who remain missing, and the ongoing quest for answers that continues to unite us all. Tramel Evans, at the young age of 25, was the epitome of an avid hiker with a passion that led him down countless trails and through a variety of landscapes. Tramel sought not just the beauty of the natural world, but also the solitude and challenge that it offered. Each hike was not just a physical journey for him, but a spiritual one as well, a chance to connect with the earth and himself on a deeper level. On April 30th of 2023, Tremel prepared for what was anticipated to be another mark in his journey as an explorer of the great outdoors. This particular adventure had him set his sights on the Black Rock Campground, a renowned starting point for hikers in the northwest corner of Joshua Tree National Park. Known for its unique geological features, stark beauty, and the mysteries whispered by its ancient landscapes, the park was a haven for hikers like Tremel. It was a place where the vast skies met the rugged earth, where every sunrise promised new discoveries. The last day he was seen, Tremel carried with him the usual essentials for a hiker, but also an air of excitement for the unknown paths that he would tread. Joshua Tree, with its twisted namesake trees and terrain that ranged from barren deserts to lush oases, was more than just a park. It was a world unto itself, filled with secrets and challenges. Tremel's plan was to hike from Black Rock to the Geology Tour Road and then return to Black Rock via the California Riding and Hiking Trail, a route familiar to him, yet always ripe with new experiences. However, what started as a routine excursion into the wilds became surrounded in an air of mystery as the days passed. The park, a place of natural wonder seemed to have drawn Tremel into its fold, keeping him beyond the reach of the world he left behind. As the scheduled date of his return came and went, the mystery deepened. The vast expanses of Joshua Tree National Park, with their allure and danger, had witnessed many stories, but Tremel's had taken an unexpected turn into the unknown. Tremel Evans had a plan that was both simple and daring. He would start his journey at Black Rock, a familiar base camp hugged by the shadows of Joshua Tree National Park's rugged peaks. From there, his path would weave through the desert, aiming for the Geology Tour Road. This stretch was not just a route, but a passage through time, where each rock and crevasse whispered ancient secrets. His return was to be via the California Riding and Hiking Trail, a ribbon of dirt and dust that snaked through the heart of the park, promising solitude and the raw beauty of the wild. May 5th was marked on the calendars as the day of Tremel's return. A friend was to meet him at the same spot where he dropped him off, expecting tales of adventure and sights unseen. But as the clock ticked past the appointed hour, Tremel was nowhere to be found. The air, once filled with anticipation, grew heavy with silence. Calls went unanswered, 
and the horizon, which had once promised the return of an explorer, now echoed with the quiet of his absence. The mystery of his disappearance began to unfold against the backdrop of Joshua Tree's vast landscapes. A place of beauty became a canvas for unanswered questions. Had Tremel wandered off from the beaten path, lured by the call of the unknown? Or had the desert, with its unforgiving terrain and hidden dangers, claimed another soul? The initial absence turned into hours, then days, sparking a search that would comb the trails and hidden valleys of the park. Reports were filed, and a sense of urgency swept through the community. The adventurer, who had set out to conquer the trails of Joshua Tree, had vanished, leaving behind a trail of mystery and concern that would soon draw many into the search for answers. As soon as Tremel Evans was reported missing on May 5th of 2023, Joshua Tree National Park became the epicenter of a massive search and rescue operation. Park Service officials, understanding the urgency and the risk of the desert, mobilized a team equipped not just with the determination to find Tremel, but with the skills honed for precisely this kind of challenge. Trained trackers, experienced in reading the subtle signs of the wilderness, scoured the trails. Searchers, familiar with every hidden valley and secret cave, spread out in a grid, calling out for Tremel, hoping for a response. Climbers, ready to tackle the park's imposing rock formations, looked for any clue that might lead to his whereabouts. Even the sky was enlisted in the effort, with helicopters cutting through the air, their crews peering down, searching for any sign of the missing hiker. The park, vast and veiled in secrets, seemed to hold its breath as the search intensified. Day after day, the teams pushed through the heat and the cold, driven by hope and the fear of what they might find. Amid this exhaustive effort, whispers of Tremel's fate began to surface. Unconfirmed sightings in Slab City and Wonder Valley sparked a flurry of activity, sending teams to these locations with a mix of hope and skepticism. Slab City, known for its off-the-grid community, and Wonder Valley, with its sparse population and wide-open spaces, offered new mysteries of their own. Were these sightings real, or just a mirage or hope in the vast desert? The search continued, days turning into weeks, with each passing moment stretching the fabric of hope thinner. The desert, a place of stark beauty and deadly challenges, offered no easy answers. Every clue, every reported sighting added a layer of mystery to this disappearance, painting a picture of a man seemingly swallowed by the landscape that he so loved. The efforts of the search teams, a testament to the resolve of those who dared to hope in the face of uncertainty, kept the story alive, even as the desert remained silent about the fate of Tremel Evans. In the cold grasp of January, nearly nine months after Tremel vanished into the wilderness, the silence of the desert was finally broken. A group of park rangers, venturing into the Covington Flats area, stumbled upon a scene that would bring a somber turn to the ongoing mystery. There, scattered among the rugged beauty of the desert, were human remains. This discovery, a tragic bookmark in the search for Tremel, lay ominously close to a collection of belongings that spoke silently over their owner's presence. Among these personal items, a backpack, unmistakably belonging to Tremel, was found. The backpack, along with other possessions scattered nearby, served as a silent testament to the final days of a hiker who had sought solace and adventure in the embrace of nature. The items, each carrying a story of their own, whispered of plans made and journeys undertaken, now halted in the quiet of the desert. The news of the discovery reached Tremel's family, who had been clinging to hope amidst the agony of uncertainty. Faced with the task of confirmation, they found themselves sifting through the personal effects recovered from the scene. Each item, a piece of a life that they feared lost, brought a heavy realization. There, in the fabric of a well-worn backpack, the pages of a journal, and the familiar threads of clothing, was the undeniable proof that they had dreaded to find. The belongings, echoes of Tremel's spirit, confirmed the worst for his family. This confirmation, though heart-wrenching, brought somber clarity to the months of searching, hoping, and waiting. The desert, which had kept its secrets closely guarded, had revealed a tragic truth. The family, united in grief but fortified by the memories of Tremel, faced this new reality with a blend of sorrow and acceptance. 
in the belongings found near the remains, they found a tangible connection to Tramel, a reminder of his love for the wild and his adventurous spirit. The discovery in Covington Flats, while bringing an end to the search, opened a new chapter of mourning and remembrance for those who knew and loved Tramel Evans. He was more than just a hiker. He was a seeker for the secrets and silence that the wild could only offer. Standing tall at six foot three, with a frame built by the trails he traversed, Tramel was a figure that seemed almost carved out of these very landscapes that he loved. His reddish brown hair, often under the shadow of a dark green beanie, and a gaze that reflected the depths of his adventures, marked him as the one who belonged to the outdoors. His affinity for hiking was not just a hobby, but a calling. Tramel found in the rugged terrains and the serene vistas a solace that the bustling cityscapes could never offer. Joshua Tree National Park, with its surreal landscapes of gnarled trees and shadowed rocks, had become a sanctuary for him. He had wandered its past many times before, each journey a testament to his enduring quest for peace and understanding of the natural world. These expeditions were not just mere walks through nature, but pilgrimages to the heart of the wild, where he sought to find himself in the vastness of the earth. Behind his passions, however, lay a struggle seldom shared with the world. Tramel grappled with his chains of alcohol withdrawals, a battle that shadowed his steps even as he sought liberation in the solitude of hiking. The wilderness offered him a reprieve, a place where he could confront his demons amidst the grandeur of nature. Yet, this very quest for healing underestimated the grip of his condition. The challenge of withdrawal, a silent torment that followed him into the embrace of nature, became an unseen adversary among its trails. Tramel's motivation for hiking transcended the physical realms, delving into the psychological need to find balance and healing. The trails offered him a canvas to paint his struggles and victories, a place where the complexity of human endurance met the simplicity of nature's offerings. His journeys were as much about confronting his inner turmoil as they were about exploring the outer world. In the silent majesty of Joshua Tree, Tramel sought not just adventure, but a sanctuary where the whispers of the wind and the warmth of the sun spoke to him, offering him a momentary break from the storm within. The disappearance of Tramel Evans stirred a profound response from both his family and the wider community. The family, in their quest for answers, reached out through social media, creating a network of support that spanned beyond their immediate circle. The digital beacon of hope became a gathering place for those who knew Tramel and many who did not, but were moved by his story. The hiking community, a vast tapestry of individuals who share a common love for the trails, rallied in solidarity. They organized searches, shared flyers, and spread the word, each action a testament to their collective resolve. Amidst the uncertainty, the community's heart swelled with messages of hope, stories of Tramel's kind spirit, and shared prayers for his safe return. This outpouring of support showcased the profound impact one soul could have on many, bridging gaps and uniting strangers in a common cause. Tramel's journey brought to light the often overlooked challenge of alcohol withdrawal, especially in the solitude of nature. His story underscores the vital importance of recognizing the signs and dangers of withdrawal, particularly for those seeking solace and healing in the wilderness. It serves as a reminder for hikers and adventurers to be mindful of their health conditions and the unique challenges they may face when isolated from immediate medical help. The conversation around Tramel's disappearance sparked a crucial dialogue about preparation, the need for awareness of personal health issues, and the importance of not underestimating the severity of withdrawal symptoms. Safety in hiking isn't just about the right gear or knowing the trail. It's equally about understanding one's physical and mental health limits. Tramel Evans' story is a narrative woven with love, mystery, and the undeniable pull of nature. His life, marked by an indomitable spirit and a deep reverence for the outdoors, touched the hearts of those who knew him and those who came to know him through his disappearance. The circumstances of his tragic end, while heart-wrenching, serve as a powerful catalyst for change and awareness in the hiking and broader outdoor communities. 
His journey reminds us of the beauty of nature and the complexities of human health, urging a deeper understanding and preparation for the challenges we may one day face or embrace in the wilderness. In remembering Trammell, we are called to advocate for increased safety measures and awareness in outdoor adventures, ensuring that the spirit of exploration is safeguarded by knowledge and care for our well-being. Through his story, Trammell Evans leaves behind a legacy that transcends the trails he walked, inspiring a future where the love for adventure is matched by a commitment to safety and health. Kyle Britton at 27 years old, was no stranger to the challenging trails and rugged beauty of Hawaii's landscapes. An experienced hiker from Honolulu, he had explored many paths with friends and family throughout his life. His love for the great outdoors was matched by his skills and knowledge of survival techniques, making him well prepared for almost any challenge nature could throw at him. Yet, on August 30th of 2019, Kyle decided to embark on a journey unlike any other he had undertaken before, a solo hike in the expansive Waipio Valley on the Big Island of Hawaii. This decision was out of the ordinary for Kyle, who had always hiked with company. The Waipio Valley, known for its stunning vistas, steep cliffs, and deep cultural significance, is as beautiful as it is treacherous. His father, Steve Britton, recounted Kyle's resolve to hike alone, expressing concerns over the decision but trusting in his son's abilities and judgments. On the morning of his disappearance, Kyle set out at around 6 a.m., driving his vehicle to the trail's entrance near the Waipio Valley lookout area. He had informed his family of his plans, marking his route on the trail towards Waimanu Valley, a path framed by a thousand-foot cliff at a 70-degree angle. This information would later become a crucial piece of the puzzle in understanding his last known whereabouts. By noon that day, a signal from Kyle's cell phone briefly pinged, offering a faint glimmer of his presence in the area. However, as hours turned into night with no word from Kyle, attempts to contact him proved futile. His family's worry deepened, leading to the filing of a missing persons report with the Hawaii Police Department on the evening of August 31st. The valley, a residence of early Hawaiian kings and a site revered for its historical and spiritual significance, had transformed into the backdrop of a perplexing disappearance. The mystery of Kyle Britton's decision to hike alone, his preparedness, and his sudden vanishing has since echoed through the valleys and communities of Hawaii, igniting a search that would draw in volunteers, experts, and the hearts of many across the nation. Before dawn on August 30th of 2019, Kyle Britton prepared to step into the unknown. It was an unusual day. Kyle, who usually hiked with friends or family, chose solitude over companionship for his journey into the Waipio Valley. As the first light of the day touched the sky, Kyle gathered his essentials, water, power bars, and his trusted cell phone. These items, simple yet vital, were all he thought he needed for the day's adventure. His father, Steve, watched with a mix of pride and worry. The decision to hike alone had sparked concern. Steve remembered cautioning Kyle about the risks, emphasizing the importance of safety. Despite his vast experience and the countless trails Kyle had conquered, hiking alone presented a new set of challenges, especially in the unfamiliar and rugged terrain of Waipio Valley. Kyle reassured his father with a plan. He would hike the trail towards Waimano Valley and return before sunset. He shared his route, promised regular check-ins, and with a sense of determination, assured his father of his readiness. The last conversation between Kyle and his family now lingers as a haunting memory. With his preparations complete and his route set, Kyle left in his vehicle, parking it near the trail's entrance as the morning unfolded. The world was unaware that this departure marked the beginning of a mystery that would captivate and concern many. As Kyle ventured into the valley, a place of immense beauty and hidden dangers, his story took a turn toward the unknown, leaving behind unanswered questions and a trail gone cold. With the break of dawn as his only witness, he ventured toward the valley's lookout, the last place anyone would report seeing him. As the day unfolded, Kyle's silence grew more pronounced. Calls to his cell phone went unanswered, texts remained undelivered, and by nightfall, worry turned into alarm. The silence from Kyle, so out of character for the experienced hiker, sent a ripple of concern through his family. 
The following day, August 31st, the gravity of Kyle's absence sank in. Faced with a day of silence and no sign of his return, his family contacted the Hawaii Police Department. A missing person report was filed, marking the official start of a search that would draw eyes and hearts from across the nation. The report sparked a flurry of activity, with law enforcement and Kyle's loved ones grappling with the sudden turn from an ordinary hike to an urgent search and rescue operation. The search for a hiker in Hawaii, missing for over a week now. He was last seen near heading towards a steep trail on the Big Island, and ABC's Marcy Gonzalez joins us with more on this now intensifying search. Good morning, Marcy. Good morning, Eva. This young man's father says he's been hiking since he was three years old and did everything right in this situation. He let people know exactly where he'd be and when to expect his next call. And when it didn't come nine days ago, his family called for help. In this scenic landscape this morning, a daunting search for this hiker missing for more than a week. Teams scouring the steep, thick terrain of the Waipio Valley on Hawaii's Big Island determined to find Kyle Britton. I have to be optimistic. Um, we all are. Two Fridays ago, the 27-year-old experienced hiker decided to spend the day on a trail he'd hiked with family in the past. This time, though, setting out by himself. He never hiked alone. And he said, I want to try it. He left at 6 a.m. His family saying his cell phone pinged at the top of the trail's more than 1,000-foot cliffs at 8 a.m. Other than his vehicle found parked nearby, there's been no sign of Kyle since. He wasn't equipped to do an overnight hike. If he's out there surviving, which we hope he is, uh, it's pretty bare essentials he's working with. But the search team, growing by the day, is well-equipped. Helicopters, dogs, and rescuers who know firsthand that anything is possible. You know, this is a very large area, so we're just trying to make sure that Kyle didn't push really far in. Javier Canelops is one of the volunteers who found Amanda Eller 17 days after she disappeared during a hike in Hawaii. I never lose hope of finding that. I mean, Amanda was a perfect example of that, you know? Of, of never losing hope. This morning, leaning on that inspiration to help fuel this search. We're all going to be here until we find him. And his family says it rained the day of Kyle's hike, so it's possible he slipped and is injured somewhere in that valley. They say there's also little cell service there, which would explain why his phone stopped pinging. Teams are heading back out to look for him this morning and raising money on GoFundMe to cover the mounting costs of this search. With. A lot of people hoping for a positive outcome. Marcy Gonzalez for us in Los Angeles. Thank you. By September 1st, the search for Kyle had mobilized into a full-scale operation. The Hawaiian Police Department and the Hilo Fire Department, equipped with the resolve to uncover Kyle's whereabouts, led the charge. The call for help echoed far and wide, urging the community to come together. Friends, family, and volunteers, driven by hope and the desire to find Kyle, gathered in solidarity. Search dogs, with their keen senses, and drones, with their sweeping views, were deployed to scour the vast expanse of YPO Valley. These efforts marked the beginning of a tireless quest, a community's united stand against the shadows of uncertainty that had claimed one of their own. The mystery of Kyle's disappearance, deepening with each passing day, became a testament to the bonds that compel us to seek and to never give up hope. As days turned into nights with no sign of Kyle, the search efforts intensified, drawing a wave of support that surged from the heart of the community and beyond. The landscape of the YPO Valley, with its daunting cliffs and dense forests, presented a formidable challenge. Yet. The spirit of the search teams remained unbroken, fueled by the hope of finding Kyle safe. With the mystery deepening, the call for volunteers echoed far and wide, resonating with a community ready to stand in solidarity. People from all walks of life, bound by a shared purpose, stepped into the unknown, braving the challenging terrain of the valley. This is day three of the search. Um, we brought in rescue dogs from Kauai, we have the helicopters going up. We have ground crews of maybe six to eight people on the ground searching the trails in the valley. Um, the police uh, rescue, fire rescue are committed for two more days. Then we're probably gonna be moving to a community-based search program. The leader of the search team from Maui 
that was successful in finding the lost woman that was lost for 17 days in Maui, he's here coordinating the search efforts for the community-based program. What we're gonna need is volunteers. Um, if you're in physical shape of any kind to hike the trails or hike the valley, we're gonna need 100, 200 people to start combing the hillsides, uh, maybe repel people if we've got that. Um, any help that you can give, um, I don't wish this on anybody. It's unbelievable. So any help you can give, we, my wife Lily and I, Kyle's mom, Kyle's brother is here. We've got family all over the islands. We love the support and help we've got so far, but I think we're gonna need a lot more. So thank you so much for everything so far. Is there a contact number that they can call for more information that you have? Um, you can call my cell, 808 Um, Ask for me, and my cell's on. We have some coverage up here, minimal, but we are checking all the time. All right, Steve, well, good luck in the continued search as we continue to search for um, Kyle. His last known whereabouts was, um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, he was gonna do a day hike. Um, hike the Z Trail. So he came Friday morning at 7 a.m. Um, somebody saw up here, he asked to use the bathroom where it was, they pointed it out and he said, thanks, have a nice day. And that's the last time anybody saw or heard from him. Um, we've had people in the valley, hikers, everybody, no one's seen or heard anything about him since then. So this is day three and uh, knowing he's out there is killing us. The response was overwhelming with hundreds of volunteers lending their time, effort, and expertise to the cause. They combed through the thickets, called out Kyle's name, and held onto the belief that their efforts would lead them to him. The logistical challenges of the search were many. The vastness of the area, coupled with its treacherous paths and limited access, tested the resolve of the search teams daily. Yet. Innovation and determination led to the deployment of drones which soared above the canopy, providing eyes in the sky where the terrain was too difficult for volunteers to reach. As the search expanded, so did the outpouring of support in the form of donations. Funds flowed in, not just from locals, but from well-wishers across the nation, all touched by Kyle's story and eager to contribute to the search efforts. These donations help fuel the logistical needs of the operation, from transportation for the search dogs to the hiring of helicopters to sweep the vast expanses of the valley from above. The national attention the case received served to amplify the urgency of the search, casting a spotlight on the mystery of Kyle's disappearance and the collective endeavor to find him. News outlets, social media, and community forums buzzed with updates and calls for assistance, drawing more volunteers and resources to the valley. In the face of adversity, the community's resolve only grew stronger, epitomizing the power of collective action and the unyielding hope of finding Kyle Britton. What's happening, everybody? Today is day 11, 12? I think it's 12. It's Tuesday. As you can see, we're going up Z Trail, which is absolutely brutal just to start off with. We got teams still in the valley. That's that swamp that we searched yesterday all the way around the perimeter. You can see just how vast this valley is, but we want to continue to search the ridge line. Unfortunately, today we don't have access to helicopters to fly us up. Tomorrow we will have three teams fly up. That's if we can't find them today, obviously. As you can imagine, most of us are beat. This is actually real small teams. Basically our main team with some local volunteers. We also have some local hunters involved. But I mean, you can see this rugged beauty. That's spectacular. And normally I would be relishing doing this. This is absolutely brutal especially after the couple of days of hiking we've already had just really tough conditions so just wanted to give an update and show you exactly where we're at seeing how much energy focus determination 
It is. So it's just a great expanse. We're going up. Talk to you soon. Javier out. As the search for Kyle Britton continued, the emotional toll on his family became heart-wrenching. Their daily lives were now consumed by the search, each day passing without Kyle, bringing a heavier burden of worry and longing. Among the volunteers, drone videographers and search experts emerged as key figures, utilizing their skills to pierce the veil of mystery surrounding Kyle's disappearance. The drone pilots, with their eyes in the sky, searched from above, while experts on the ground navigated the treacherous terrain, each step guided by the hope of finding a clue, a sign, anything that could lead to Kyle. Uh, we're just pushing back into the valley again. We're going to do some, some gully work and just see if there's any spots that he potentially would have, have slipped or just... We don't know at this point, and uh, we're reopening, reopening our ideas to things that we we think we had checked already. Uh, now that we have a little bit more resources and a little bit more experience, <laughs> um, we've got our, our our master diver here who just took a little spill. Um, didn't go down the cliff though, which is Thank a good God. thing. Um, but yeah, just hoping we find them today. Uh, at this point, closure at any point, um, you know, it's what we want. Absolutely, we man. We really want him to be alive and absolutely. I want to slap the hell out of him, <laughs> but the nights are getting harder. The days are getting harder, uh, but we're not going to stop. Fuck I mean, yeah, man. He's out here somewhere. And, and that's what keeps us going. So we're just going. Absolutely, dude. Thank you so much, Sam. All right, guys. Take you up soon. As days turned into weeks, the official search efforts began to wane, but the community's determination did not. The mission to find Kyle transitioned into a community-led effort, a testament to the bond and collective will of those involved. The valley, once a place of natural beauty and solitude, had now become a symbol of unity and hope. Kyle's family, at the heart of this endeavor, continued to lead the charge, their faith unwavering. They organized searches, coordinated with volunteers, and ensured that Kyle's story remained at the forefront of the community's consciousness. Their home became a hub of activity, maps lined the walls, and plans were made and remade, each strategy fueled by the singular goal of finding Kyle. In the face of uncertainty, the community's hope remained persistent. The search for Kyle Britton had brought together people from all walks of life, each contributing in their own way to the efforts. It was this collective hope, this united front, that illuminated the path forward. A beacon in the search for Kyle, keeping alive the belief that he would be found. Today, the search for Kyle remains active in the hearts of those who knew him and in the community that came together in his name. The efforts have evolved, but the hope for Kyle's safe return burns as brightly as ever. Volunteers continue to gather, share stories, and comb through new areas, driven by the belief that Kyle is still out there. The legacy of Kyle's disappearance transcends the immediate urgency of the search efforts. It has woven a fabric of awareness and community support that will endure. His story has inspired initiatives focused on improving hiking safety, emergency preparedness, and the establishment of a support network for families facing similar ordeals. The valley where Kyle was last seen has become more than a backdrop to his mysterious disappearance. It stands as a symbol of communal strength, resilience, and the indomitable spirit of hope. In the search for Kyle Britton, a community found its unity, a family found its strength, and the world was reminded of the profound impact one person could have on the hearts of so many. The quest to find Kyle goes on, with each day bringing new efforts, new challenges, and renewed commitment to bringing him home. In the quiet, coastal community of Gulf Breeze, Florida, the disappearance of 23-year-old Adam Clayton Lyle Jones in the spring of 2011 began as a simple departure from Florida and evolved into a profound mystery. 
Adam's story, characterized by inexplicable decisions and a sudden vanishing, continues to haunt those seeking answers. On a seemingly ordinary day, March 31st of 2011, Adam left his home. His retreat was marked by a peculiar lack of preparation. While most would carry essentials for a long trip, Adam took only his laptop, leaving behind his cell phone and other personal items. This choice painted the first stroke of mystery in Adam's case. Why embark on a lengthy journey with such minimal belongings? Adam's mode of transportation, a 1986 Oldsmobile sedan, was easily recognizable. It was light blue with a distinctive dark blue vinyl top and missing hubcaps. The car itself was later found abandoned. This would become a significant clue in unraveling the mystery of his whereabouts. The discovery of Adam's car was made by a ranger at the Grand Canyon Visitor Center on May 5th of 2011, over a month after his departure. This was the moment Adam's disappearance transformed from a family concern into a broader puzzle. Inside the vehicle, an itinerary revealed plans seemingly uncharacteristic of an impromptu trip. It listed destinations in Denver, Colorado, and various cities in California, suggesting a route that Adam had possibly planned with care. The car's location at the Grand Canyon's south rim added layers to the mystery. The canyon, known for its vast and imposing landscape, seemed an unlikely destination for Adam, given the absence of personal effects or preparation for a trek in such challenging terrain. Why was Adam drawn to this iconic yet daunting location? Was the Grand Canyon a planned destination or merely a stop along a route dictated by an unknown purpose? Attempts to trace Adam's movements led to a trail of transactions across Louisiana and Texas as indicated by his debit card. Yet, these traces provided no insights into his intentions or state of mind. A potential lead, a friend in Yuma, Arizona, yielded no new information, deepening the intrigue surrounding this journey. Adam's physical description was widely circulated. A young man with short brown hair, blue eyes, possibly sporting facial hair, and with distinct heavy eyebrows. His casual attire, consisting of a t-shirt, jeans, and tennis shoes, was more suited for a day out rather than a voyage into the wilderness of the Grand Canyon. This mismatch between his apparent destination and his preparedness added to the puzzling nature of this disappearance. The case took an even more baffling turn with the complete lack of communication. Adam's decision to travel without a cell phone meant that there were no digital breadcrumbs to follow, a rarity in the age of electronic communication. The lack of any digital or personal trail after his departure from Florida only compounded the mystery. The situation left Adam's family, friends, and the authorities grappling with numerous unanswered questions. What led Adam to embark on this journey? What was the significance of the destination marked on his itinerary? And most crucially, what happened to him after his car was found abandoned at one of the nation's most renowned natural landmarks? As time passed, the mystery of Adam Clayton Lyle Jones's fate continues to perplex those who knew him and those who later became acquainted with his story. The circumstances of his disappearance, the unexplained nature of his travel plans, and the puzzling discovery of his abandoned car at the Grand Canyon form a narrative that is as confounding as it is intriguing. Adam's case remains a mystery, unsolved and puzzling, leaving a lingering question mark over the events of the spring of 2011 at the Grand Canyon. Sandra Hughes, a 54-year-old woman, decided to make a significant change in her life. Up until then, her life hadn't gone as she had hoped. After two divorces and a career in accounting, despite her passion for the outdoors and wilderness survival, Sandra found herself longing for more. She had spent most of her adult life moving around, never really settling down or finding a place she could call home. In June of 2020, amid the quiet pause of the world due to quarantine restrictions, Sandra saw an opportunity to reconnect with her love for nature. She sold her place in Maui, Hawaii, and moved to Madeira County, California, located between Yosemite National Park and the Sierra National Forest. 
Sandra planned an extended solo camping trip into the Sierra National Forest, aiming to find happiness and fulfillment while adhering to quarantine guidelines. This decision marked the beginning of a mystery that would captivate many. Sandra Hughes found herself at a crossroads in life, leading up to her mysterious disappearance. Her history was marked by a nomadic existence, characterized by a series of moves from one place to another across the vast landscapes of the United States. This constant motion reflected a search for something more, a pursuit that seemed to elude her in her settled life. Professionally, Sandra had built a career in accounting, a field that demanded precision and analytical skills. However, beneath the surface of numbers and financial statements, there was another side to her, a profound connection to the wilderness. Sandra was not only an accountant, she was also a skilled survivalist. Her college years had been spent not just poring over textbooks on accounting, but also engaging deeply with wilderness survival courses. This education wasn't just academic, it was a passion deeply ingrained in her being. Sandra's personal life, however, bore the marks of its own trials and tribulations. She had entered into two marriages, hoping perhaps to build a life together with someone who shared her dreams and aspirations. Unfortunately, both marriages ended in divorce, leaving her to navigate the complexities of life's journeys alone. Moreover, the absence of children in her life added another layer of solitude to her existence. Yet, despite these personal setbacks, Sandra's spirit remained unbroken. Her passion for the outdoors, an unwavering love for the raw beauty and untamed wilderness, continued to be a source of joy and solace. This combination of her professional expertise, her survival skills, and her deep-seated love for nature painted a picture of a woman who, despite the unpredictabilities and the disappointments that life had thrown her way, was determined to carve out moments of fulfillment and happiness. It was this indomitable spirit that led her to make the significant decision to embark on a solo camping trip into the Sierra National Forest, a decision that marked the beginning of a mysterious chapter in her life. Sandra Hughes' journey into the unknown began in June of 2020 when she made a bold move to embrace nature in a way she hadn't before. She had just settled into her new life in Madeira County, California, a place chosen for its close proximity to the breathtaking landscapes of Yosemite National Park and the Sierra National Forest. Inspired by the world slowing down due to quarantine, Sandra saw a perfect chance to reconnect with her outdoor roots. Her last communication with her family was filled with excitement and a hint of adventure. Sandra shared her plans for an extended solo camping trip into the Sierra National Forest. She was drawn to the beauty and solitude of Johnson Meadows, a spot known for its stunning green expanses framed by thick forests and towering snow-capped mountains. This would be her retreat, a place to find peace and solace in the wilderness that she so dearly loved. The decision to venture into the National Forest alone was met with support from her family, who understood Sandra's need to be one with nature. Despite the inherent risks of solo camping, Sandra's skills in wilderness survival reassured her loved ones that she was well prepared for the journey ahead. Little did they know this would be the last time they would hear from her, as Sandra set off into the forest, eagerly anticipating the tranquility and fulfillment that awaited her in Johnson Meadows. On July 2nd, a group of hikers stumbled upon a campsite that caught their attention for all the wrong reasons. It was Sandra Hughes' campsite, but it didn't look like any ordinary site left by a camper temporarily away. Instead, it was abandoned and in complete disarray, as if a storm had passed through, scattering gear and personal items everywhere. The tent was torn apart, and the belongings were strewn about, indicating a sudden and chaotic departure. The hikers, concerned by the state of the campsite and the possibility that its occupant might be in danger, decided to take action. They meticulously marked the location on their map, ensuring they could direct others back to this exact spot. Once they had cell service, they immediately contacted the Madeira County Sheriff's Office to report what they had found. The Sheriff's Office dispatched officers to Johnson Meadows to investigate the campsite. Upon arrival, they confirmed the hikers' findings. 
the site was indeed abandoned, and the destruction suggested a distressing event had occurred. Among the scattered items, they found identification belonging to Sandra Hughes, confirming her as the campsite's occupant and raising urgent concerns for her safety and whereabouts. An extensive search operation was launched to find her. Law enforcement, alongside a group of volunteers, combed through the vast expanse of the Sierra National Forest. They covered ground on foot, utilized sniffer dogs, and even deployed helicopters to broaden the search area. Despite their efforts, Sandra remained elusive, with no clear signs pointing to her whereabouts. However, during this tense time, there were reported sightings of Sandra that added layers of mystery to her disappearance. Witnesses described seeing a woman matching Sandra's description, distinctive because of her blue hair, appearing out of place and disoriented in the wilderness. In one sighting, she was described as barefoot, wearing a black shirt and blue jeans, with a noticeable bruise on her face. This description matched Sandra's last known appearance, yet her behavior seemed unusual. She did not signal for help or indicate that she was in distress, leaving witnesses confused and concerned. Adding to the complexity of the search was the discovery of Sandra's vehicle in a ravine several miles from where her campsite had been found. The car appeared to have crashed, rolling down an embankment off a winding forest road. There was no blood found inside the vehicle, which left questions about whether Sandra had been injured in the accident. Like her campsite, personal items were scattered all around the vehicle, suggesting someone had rummaged through it after the crash. This discovery deepened the mystery, raising more questions about the events leading up to and following Sandra's disappearance. The unexpected discovery of Sandra's sleeping bag near the remote Spotted Lake in Yosemite National Park added another layer to her already mysterious disappearance. Found a considerable distance from both her destroyed campsite and where her vehicle had met its unfortunate end in a ravine, the sleeping bag's location was a crucial clue that seemed to defy simple explanation. Positioned in a part of the park known for its rugged beauty and challenging terrain, the sleeping bag appeared as though it had been used recently, suggesting that Sandra had made it at least this far in her unexplained journey. This sequence of discoveries, starting from her initial campsite in the Sierra National Forest, to her car in the ravine, and now the sleeping bag near Spotted Lake, drew a puzzling line across the map. Each point seemed to suggest a deliberate, albeit perplexing, northward trajectory through some of the most unforgiving wilderness areas in California. The questions this path raised were intriguing. Was Sandra intentionally moving north? And if so, why? How had she managed to traverse such difficult landscapes, seemingly without the bulk of her gear, and, as some sightings suggested, in a barefoot and disheveled state? Moreover, this linear path of locations connected with Sandra's disappearance did little to clarify her motivations or the circumstances that led her deeper into the wilderness. Instead, it only deepened the mystery, weaving a complex series of events that search teams and investigators struggled to unravel. The search efforts, initially focused on finding Sandra, now also had to connect with understanding the rationale behind her movements. Was she seeking something or someone, fleeing from a perceived threat, or simply disoriented and lost? In a twist that reignited interest in Sandra Hughes' puzzling disappearance, two hunters reported a strange encounter that seemed to be directly linked to her case. While driving down a secluded forest road, they noticed a woman who bore a striking resemblance to Sandra. She was positioned away from the road, leaning against a tree in a manner that seemed both deliberate and out of place. The hunters described the woman as having no camping gear or any obvious means of support in the dense forest, a detail that immediately raised questions about her well-being and how she had come to be in such a remote location. The woman's appearance matched descriptions of Sandra. She was wearing overalls and a floral t-shirt, a change from the last reported sighting, but still consistent with her being without her original gear. The sighting added to the growing list of odd occurrences surrounding her disappearance. The woman's presence in the forest, without any belongings, suggested a pattern of erratic behavior or circumstances beyond her control. The hunters attempted to communicate with the woman, hoping to offer her help or at least confirm her identity, but she did not respond to their calls. 
This lack of interaction, coupled with her unusual location and state of being, mirrored the chaotic and unexplained scenes left behind at Sandra's last known sites. Despite the hunter's attempts to unravel the situation, the woman's identity and circumstances remained unclear, further complicating this already mystifying case. In another chilling development, the Gorba family shared a haunting experience that added a perplexing layer to the mystery of Sandra Hughes. While on a drive in the Sierra National Forest, their three-year-old son, Caden, began speaking to someone invisible to everyone else. Caden insisted there was a woman outside needing help. This claim startled his parents, especially when he described the woman as lying face down with her legs up in the air, suggesting a dire situation. Caden's description of the woman was eerily specific. She wore a black shirt, blue jeans, and had blue hair. This matched the previous descriptions of Sandra Hughes, capturing the attention of both the family and later of law enforcement. The detail about the blue hair in particular was a significant clue linking the child's claim directly to Sandra. The Gorba family, deeply unsettled by Caden's assertions, promptly left the area. They later shared their story, which quickly caught the attention of the authorities. Law enforcement took Caden's claim seriously, especially given the specificity of his description and its alignment with Sandra's last known appearance. This led to a renewed interest in the area described by Caden, as officials and the family grappled with the eerie possibility that the young boy might have seen Sandra, or at least an apparition of her, when no one else could. The disappearance of Sandra Hughes remains an unsolved puzzle, weaving together a series of strange events and sightings into a mystery that has yet to be unraveled. Despite extensive search efforts and the peculiar details brought forth by witnesses and even the child, Sandra's fate and whereabouts remain unknown. Her journey, which began as a quest for solitude and connection with nature, has turned into a haunting tale of disappearance and intrigue. We encourage anyone with information, no matter how small or seemingly insignificant, to come forward and contact the Madeira County Sheriff's Office. Your piece of the puzzle could be the key to uncovering the truth about what happened to Sandra Hughes. This story is a reminder of the profound mysteries that lie in the heart of the wilderness, challenging our understanding and often leaving more questions than answers. The search for Sandra continues, not just as a quest for one woman, but as a pursuit of truth in the face of the unknown. As we reflect on her story, we are reminded of the complexity and unpredictability of life and the enduring nature of mysteries that compel us to keep searching, keep questioning, and never give up hope. In 1978, amidst the sprawling expanse of the Grand Canyon's rugged terrain, a story unfolded that would etch itself into the records of unsolved mysteries. Jeffrey Ridenauer, a 63-year-old, embarked on a journey into the heart of one of nature's most formidable landscapes. An experienced hiker from Southern California, Jeffrey sought refuge from the monotony of urban life, yearning for the freedom and challenge offered by the vast wilderness. The Grand Canyon, a marvel of geological history and testament to the raw power of natural forces, was the backdrop for Jeffrey's ambitious trek. He planned to navigate the south rim of the canyon, a route he had braved only once before. His preparation was meticulous. He parked a station wagon in the Tanner Trails parking lot and had a bicycle strategically placed at the New Hance Trails end. Jeffrey's journey was to span between these points, traversing the Colorado River's banks, climbing cliffs, and navigating ledges that have witnessed eons of history. A note left on his bicycle served as a silent testament to his intentions. Hiking the canyon will be out by May 28th. It was a promise to the world and himself, a declaration of his resolve to conquer the challenges that lay ahead. However, the canyon, with its vast expanse of rock, sand, and silence, seemed to defy this very notion of life and death, swallowing up tales of those who dared to traverse its paths. Despite receiving a backcountry permit marked with caution due to his limited canyon hikes, Jeffrey's confidence in his physical capabilities persuaded the issuing ranger. The warnings of extreme temperatures, which had soared above 115 degrees, did little to deter him. 
The ranger, noting Jeffrey's articulate assurance and the heavy snowfall that winter, which promised more water sources, reluctantly agreed to this journey. As the days passed, Jeffrey's absence became a growing concern. The permit he was supposed to return went unsubmitted, prompting a search that would soon reveal the mysterious disappearance of his vehicle. Initially absent from its designated spot, the Dodge Dart station wagon reappeared, suggesting a return that only deepened the mystery. Rangers speculated that Jeffrey might have come back to resupply, embarking once again into the canyon's depths. The subsequent search operation, launched on June 4th, was unprecedented in scale at the time. Over 50 ground searchers combed the terrain, helicopters circled overhead, and repelling teams scoured the cliffs and ledges for any sign of Jeffrey. Yet, the canyon remained silent, offering no clues to his whereabouts. The discovery of a pair of glasses and a razor, meticulously placed on a rock near one of Jeffrey's supposed campsites, provided a fleeting hope. Yet, even these could not be definitively linked to him. As the search extended, covering over a hundred square miles of canyon country, the realization dawned that Jeffrey might never be found. The vastness of the Grand Canyon, with its myriad of hiding places and relentless flow of the Colorado River, seemed to have claimed another soul. Rangers contemplated the futility of scuba searches in the river's treacherous waters, resigning themselves to the likelihood that Jeffrey's remains would only surface with time, if at all. The mystery of Jeffrey Rittenauer's disappearance remains unsolved, a narrative lost to the echoes of the Grand Canyon. Despite one of the largest search operations in the park's history, no conclusive evidence has surfaced, leaving only speculation and unanswered questions. The lack of a single photograph or definitive clue has rendered Jeffrey's story a ghostly presence in the canyon's lore. Decades have passed since Jeffrey ventured into the Grand Canyon, never to be seen again. His story, one of adventure, ambition, and the unfathomable mysteries of nature, lingers as a cautionary tale. It reminds us of the canyon's indomitable spirit and the fine line between humanity's quest for adventure and the immutable forces of the natural world. Jeffrey Ridenour, in his pursuit of solitude and challenge, became a part of the Grand Canyon's mystique a symbol of eternal dance between man and the wild, where some steps are forever lost in the shadows of towering cliffs and the roaring sound of the river below. The story of Dr. Sam Duball, a man whose disappearance in the wilds of Mount Rainier National Park has left a void in the hearts of those who knew him and a puzzle for those drawn to the mysteries of our natural world. Dr. Sam Duball was not just like any other hiker lost to the unpredictable whims of nature. He was a beacon of intellect and passion, a 33-year-old assistant professor at the University of Washington. His life was a testament to the pursuit of knowledge and the exploration of the vast, untamed wilderness. Sam's love for the outdoors was matched only by his academic rigor. A seasoned traveler, he had ventured through the rugged terrains of the Himalayas, where the earth touches the sky, seeking not just adventure, but a deeper connection with the world around him. But who was Dr. Sam Duball beyond the headlines in the search reports? Born with a thirst for understanding the human condition, Sam embarked on an educational journey that saw him graduating from Stanford, immersing himself in the rigorous medical curriculum at Harvard Medical School and ultimately earning a Ph.D. in medical anthropology from UC Berkeley. His academic pursuits were driven by a profound desire to unravel the complexities of humanity, to explore what binds us in our shared experience and what divides us in our individual struggles. Sam's work and research took him to the heart of Uganda, where he focused on the Lord's Resistance Army, a group as controversial as it is misunderstood. It was here, amidst the backdrop of conflict and resilience, that Sam found the inspiration for his book, Against Humanity, Lessons from the Lord's Resistance Army. This was not just another academic adventure. It was a bold critique of the very concept of humanity, challenging the foundation of human rights and humanitarian missions. Through his writing, Sam sought to illuminate the shadows of the human experience, to question the constructs that define our understanding of good and evil, right and wrong. 
His journey was not solely about exploring the external landscapes of our planet or the societal structures of distant cultures. It was about an inward quest, a relentless search for truth and meaning in a world that often seems devoid of both. Sam's work bridged the gap between the academic and the personal, inviting us to ponder the essence of our being and the paths we chose to navigate through the journey of life. As we explore the mystery of Dr. Sam Duball's disappearance, we are reminded of the fragility of human existence and the indomitable spirit of those who dare to question, to seek, and to dream. Sam's story is a reflection of our innate desire to connect with the world beyond the confines of our immediate reality, to venture into the unknown in pursuit of something greater than ourselves. In the silence of the mountains, where Dr. Duball walked, there echoes a call to each of us, a call to explore, to understand, and to cherish the profound mysteries of our universe. In a chapter that would introduce an unwelcome twist in the narrative of Dr. Sam Duball's life, October 9th of 2020 dawned with the promise of adventure. On this day, Sam embarked on what was to be a solitary journey through the serene landscape of Mount Rainier National Park choosing the Mother Mountain Loop Trail as his path for exploration. The allure of the trail, with its breathtaking vistas and the tranquil solitude it offered, was irresistible to a soul as adventurous as Sam's. With his preparations complete and his spirits high, he set off into the heart of the wilderness, expected to return by the following day, October 10th. However, as the hours turned into days, an unsettling silence took hold. The man who had ventured into the embrace of nature did not return as anticipated. On the day of his departure, fellow hikers and nature enthusiasts reported spotting Sam near Lake Mowich, an area known for its stunning beauty and peaceful surroundings. This sighting would later mark the last known point of his presence in the vast expanse of the park. The realization that Sam had not returned on schedule prompted concern and action. By October 12th, with no word from Sam and no sign of his return, the alarming reality set in. He was missing. The absence of communication from him, a hiker, both experienced and well-prepared, ignited a flurry of worry among his family, friends, and the hiking community. The news of his disappearance spread rapidly, casting a shadow over the natural splendor of Mount Rainier. As the search for Sam Duball began, so too did a chapter filled with uncertainty, hope, and the collective desire of a community seeking to find one of their own. In response to Sam Duball's disappearance, a concerted and extensive search operation was swiftly launched by the Mount Rainier National Park Service, drawing upon the dedication and expertise of both park rangers and a brigade of volunteers. This united effort saw the wilderness combed with meticulous care, as search teams navigated the rugged and diverse terrain of the park with the singular aim of locating Sam. Despite Sam's thorough preparation for his journey, which included a range of equipment designed to ensure his safety and comfort in the wilderness, the search yielded little in the way of clues. The discovery of a water bottle near the Loop Trail stood as the lone tangible link to Sam's path through the expansive natural landscape. This finding, though significant, did not lead to the breakthrough that the search teams and Sam's loved ones had hoped for. As the days passed, the operation faced mounting challenges. The weather, always a force in the high mountains, turned against the search efforts. Poor conditions hampered the ability of the teams to cover ground and thoroughly search potential areas where Sam might have been. Visibility was reduced, paths became treacherous, and the inherent risks of mountain search and rescue operations were magnified under such adverse weather conditions. With each passing day, Hope waned as the elements continued to obstruct the search. After several days of relentless effort, faced with the daunting reality of the situation and the unforgiving nature of the environment, the decision was made to suspend the operation. Sam was presumed dead, leaving a void in the hearts of those who knew him and a lingering question in the minds of those involved in the search. The decision marked a sad moment a pause in the physical search, but not an end to a quest for understanding as to what happened to Dr. Sam Duball on his hike in Mount Rainier National Park. 
Mount Rainier is a towering figure in the landscape of the Pacific Northwest. It stands as a sentinel over the surrounding terrain. This majestic peak, reaching an elevation of 14,411 feet, is not only the highest mountain in the state of Washington, but also one of the most iconic features of the Cascade Range. Beneath its serene appearance, however, lies the heart of an active volcano. Its potential for eruption places it among the most dangerous volcanoes in the world, a stark reminder of the raw power of nature. Over the years, Mount Rainier has witnessed its share of hiking accidents, each a testament to the mountain's unpredictable and perilous nature. Despite these dangers, or perhaps because of them, the mountain continues to draw adventurers and nature lovers to its slopes, each seeking to experience the awe-inspiring beauty and the thrill of the ascent. Nestled within this rugged and breathtaking landscape is the Mother Mountain Loop Trail, a journey through some of the park's most stunning and diverse terrains. The trail offers a glimpse into the heart of Mount Rainier National Park, winding its way through lush forests, alpine meadows, and past tranquil lakes. Starting from the Mowich Lake campground, the trail invites hikers to embark on a journey that is as beautiful as it is challenging. The route leads adventurers past the southeast side of Moak Lake, through the Knapsack Pass, and into the expansive beauty of Spray Park and Mist Park, areas renowned for their wildflowers and scenic vistas. Despite the inherent risks associated with any hike in such a rugged environment, the Mother Mountain Loop Trail is known for its relative safety, provided hikers are prepared and respect the mountain's conditions. The trail's design and the park's management have worked in tandem to create a route that, while challenging, avoids the most perilous aspects of mountain hiking. Yet, as with any wilderness expedition, the beauty of the trail is matched by the respect it demands for the natural forces that shape it. The legacy of Dr. Sam Duball extends far beyond the echoes of his footsteps on the Mother Mountain Loop Trail. His profound contributions to the fields of anthropology and medicine have left an indelible mark on the academic world and beyond. Sam was at the forefront of creating radical medicine, a pioneering field that sought to reimagine the practice of medicine through a lens of social justice and anti-racism. His vision for the healthcare system that not only heals but also addresses the root cause of inequality is a testament to his deep commitment to creating a better world. Sam's personal impact resonates through the heartfelt tributes from his family, colleagues, and the broad academic community. They speak of a man with an unwavering moral compass, whose life was dedicated to the pursuit of justice and the dismantling of racism within the medical field and society at large. His work, characterized by courage and unyielding dedication to his principles, continues to inspire those who were fortunate enough to know him and those who encounter his legacy. The mystery surrounding Sam Duball's disappearance has galvanized a community united in their desire for answers. Despite extensive search efforts and a petition by Sam's family urging the continuation of the search, no further evidence of his whereabouts has been uncovered. This has led to theories and eyewitness accounts speculating on the circumstances that may have led to his disappearance. Some hikers who have traversed the same trail ponder the possibility that Sam may have deviated from his intended path, leading to an unforeseen accident. The absence of concrete evidence only deepens the mystery and fuels the discussion about what could have transpired in the vast wilderness of Mount Rainier National Park. The impact of Sam's disappearance reverberates through his family, colleagues, and the wider community, leaving a void filled with memories of his passion, kindness, and the relentless quest for justice. The unresolved nature of his disappearance continues to be a source of pain and uncertainty, yet it also serves as a beacon of hope. Hope that one day, the answers that are sought will be found, bringing closure to those who loved him. Sam's story highlights the broader issue of missing persons in national parks and the inherent challenges faced by search and rescue operations. It underscores the need for continued awareness, preparedness, and resources to ensure the safety of those who venture into the wild. As we reflect on the legacy of Dr. Sam Duball and the ongoing mystery of his disappearance, we are reminded of the fragility of life 
the strength of the human spirit, and the enduring hope for answers in the face of uncertainty. In the autumn of 1981, the Great Smoky Mountains wore a majestic cloak of reds, oranges, and yellows, painting a breathtaking canvas that attracts nature lovers from far and wide. Nestled in the heart of this natural splendor lies the Deep Creek Campground, a haven for those seeking the serene embrace of nature and the simple joys of outdoor life. It is here, amidst the whispering trees and meandering trails, that Thelma, Pauline, Melton, or Polly, and her husband, Bob Melton, find their seasonal retreat, escaping the hustle of the everyday to bask in the tranquil beauty of the fall months. Polly, rarely known by her given name, Thelma, carries life stories woven with threads of joy, hardship, and adventure. Married to Bob, a man 20 years her senior, their union marks Polly's third attempt at matrimonial bliss. Yet, it is with Bob that Polly seems to have found a true partner, with whom she shared not just her love, but a jest for the nomadic lifestyle that sees them living out of an Airstream trailer. This portable home on wheels symbolizes more than just a means of travel. It represents freedom, a shared dream, and a life unbound by the conventional. Standing here, amidst fall colors in the Great Smoky Mountains, I feel an overwhelming sense of peace. Deep Creek Campground isn't just a retreat, it's become a part of who I am. Our life together, unconventional as it may be, living out of our Airstream trailer, represents freedom, a shared dream, a testament to a life unbound by the usual paths. Every day is a new adventure, and as I look out at the mountains, I'm grateful for the journey that brought me here. With Bob by my side, I've found a completeness I didn't know I was searching for. This life, our life, is unconventional, but it's ours, and I wouldn't have it any other way. This is my home. Their bond, strengthened by the shared silence and laughter within the compact walls of their airstream, grows deeper with each passing year. Bob, now 78, finds his world increasingly confined to the interior of their mobile home. His health, a declining slope that contrasts sharply with the vibrant landscape outside. Polly, 58, vibrant and full of life, finds solace and strength in the great outdoors, her passion for hiking undimmed by the passing years or her own battles with health issues. Each fall, as the mountains call, Polly and Bob make their trip to the Deep Creek Campground. It's a ritual, an annual journey that Polly treasures above all else. For two decades, this tradition has anchored her, a constant in her life marked by change. The campground, with its community of fellow retirees and nature enthusiasts, becomes a second home, a place where Polly is not just known but cherished. Here, friendships are forged in campfires and conversations under the vast canopy of the stars. The dynamics within this close-knit community are unique. Newcomers are embraced only through a collective nod of approval a testament to the tight bonds formed in this secluded paradise. Polly, with her easy smile and helping hand, is a linchpin in this community, her presence as familiar as the perennial trees surrounding them. With Bob by her side, albeit more in spirit than on hikes, Polly navigates the trails and the complexities of campground relationships with equal ease, her life rich with the threads of nature, love, and communal living. Arriving at Deep Creek Campground in the heart of the Great Smoky Mountains fall splendor, I was immediately struck by the vibrant colors and the sense of community that seemed to permeate the air. I had heard about the close-knit group of retirees and nature lovers who called this place a second home, and I was eager to find my own place among them. It wasn't long before I learned of Polly and Bob Melton, pillars of this community. Polly, with her infectious smile and generous spirit, quickly became a figure of intrigue and admiration for me. She navigated the campground and its relationships with a grace that made her beloved by all. Bob, though less physically present on the trails, was equally a part of the community's heart, his bond with Polly, a testament to enduring partnership. As the days passed, I found myself becoming more intertwined with the life here. The welcoming nature of the community so deeply influenced by Polly's warmth and Bob's quiet strength, offered a sense of belonging I hadn't known I was seeking. Around campfires and under the canopy of stars, I began to weave my own threads into the fabric of this community, 
discovering a life enriched by nature, companionship, and shared stories. Here, in the embrace of the mountains and the company of newfound friends, I found a home. As 1981 unfolds, the serene beauty of the Smoky Mountains and the predictable rhythm of campground life mask the undercurrents of mystery that swirl quietly beneath the surface. Little does anyone know, this year will etch the name Thelma, Pauline, Polly, Melton into the fabric of unsolved mysteries. Her story, a whisper among the rustling leaves, a shadow in the misty expanse of the mountain that she so dearly loves. On the morning of September 25th, 1981, the dense canopy of the Great Smoky Mountains seemed to hold its breath, a prelude to the day that would etch itself into the memory of the Deep Creek campground. Polly made an uncharacteristic choice that morning. For years, her routine had been as predictable as the sunrise, including her commitment to serving food to local senior citizens, a task that she approached with a blend of duty and delight. Yet, on this day, Polly opted out, setting aside her volunteer apron for reasons that would remain a whisper among the trees. This decision was the first thread of abnormality in what was to unfold as a mystery. Polly instead turned her focus to the mountains that called to her spirit. As she readied herself, her actions seemed no different from any other day destined for the trails, except for the palpable absence of her usual morning destination. Joined by her friends Red and Truella, the trio set off into the heart of the Smoky Mountains. The air was crisp, the path ahead was a familiar friend to Polly, who had traversed these trails countless times before. Laughter and light-hearting teasing flowed easily among them, a testament to the depths of their friendship and the joy they found in each other's company. Polly, usually keeping pace with Red and Truella, inexplicably began to accelerate, her strides growing longer, her pace quickening, until she was a solitary figure on the move ahead. At first I thought it was all in jest, a playful challenge perhaps, but the widening gap between us felt out of character. Polly, wait up. I called, half laughing, half concerned, yet she didn't slow down. My laughter faded into the crisp mountain air, replaced by a growing unease. What prompted this sudden burst of speed? Was Polly simply lost in thought, or was there something more pressing on her mind? As she disappeared from view, a knot formed in my stomach. This wasn't like our Polly, the friend who thrived on our camaraderie, who always made sure we were together, especially in the unpredictable wilderness of the Smokies. I exchanged a look with Truella, both of us masked in confusion and concern. We quickened our pace, hoping to catch up, to return to the comfortable rhythm of our friendship that seemed, in that moment, as distant as Polly herself. The playful banter that had been a constant companion on their hikes fell silent as Polly's form became smaller, eventually disappearing over a crest in the trail. It was a moment suspended in time, when the ordinary act of hiking morphed into the opening scene of a mystery that would haunt the campground. When Red and Truella reached the point where Polly had vanished from their view, they found not their friend, but the empty path, an eerie quiet setting over the forest. Panic, a foreign intruder on their routine hikes, crept into the hearts of Red and Truella. Confusion painted their features as they called out for Polly, their voices swallowed by the vastness of the mountains. The initial search, fueled by a growing sense of urgency, yielded no sign of their friend. The decision to involve the park rangers marked the escalation of the situation from a simple misunderstanding to a full-scale search and rescue operation. The tranquility of Deep Creek Campground was shattered, replaced by the frantic energy of the search teams and the whispered fears of a community suddenly thrust into the unknown. The moment we realized Polly was missing, a cold wave of panic washed over me. Our calls for her, desperate and hopeful, were just absorbed by the vastness of the mountains, leaving us in a suffocating silence. What started as a routine hike spiraled into confusion and fear as Polly remained nowhere to be found. We had to get the park rangers involved, marking a grim turn from a mere worry to a serious search operation. The peaceful atmosphere of Deep Creek Campground was shattered, now pulsing with the urgent movements of search teams and the anxious murmurs of our tight-knit community. As darkness fell upon the mountains, the reality of the situation sank in. The Smokies, a place of joy and refuge for Polly, 
had become the backdrop for our worst fears. Dawn brought no relief, only the intensification of the search as volunteers joined, transforming the landscape into a frenzy of activity. I was struck by the community's outpouring of support, yet beneath the action, a deep unease gnawed at me. The mountains, our sanctuary, now held a mystery that seemed as vast and impenetrable as the forests themselves. With each unanswered call, with every unturned leaf, the weight of Polly's absence grew heavier, turning what should have been an ordinary day into anything but. Despite the collective resolve fueling the search, each effort seemed to dissolve into the mountain air, leaving behind a trail of frustration and unanswered questions. The distinctive pattern of Polly's shoe prints, a potential breadcrumb in the vast wilderness, offered a glimmer of hope a tangible connection to the woman who had vanished. Search dogs, with their keen senses, were unleashed into the forest, their noses skimming the ground, seeking any scent of Polly. Yet, even their remarkable abilities seemed to falter against the mystery, leading only to dead ends and deepening the sense of perplexity surrounding her disappearance. The campground and the broader community of Bryson City, bound by the shared rhythm of seasonal migrants and the camaraderie of the great outdoors, found themselves united in shock and disbelief. The tight-knit fabric of this community, where newcomers were embraced only through collective agreement, now faced the unthinkable. Conversations around campfires turned somber. The laughter and stories of yesteryears overshadowed by the pervasive question, what happened to Polly? This collective bewilderment and concern underscored the deep connections formed, where Polly was not just a familiar face, but a cherished member of an extended family. As days turned into weeks without any sign of Polly, the void left by her absence became a breeding ground for theories and speculation. Some theorized the possibility of an abduction, despite the lack of any struggle or witnesses. Theories ventured into the wilderness itself, pondering if an animal attack could be responsible, though the absence of any evidence lent little credence to this idea. Others contemplated a more deliberate disappearance, suggesting that Polly, perhaps overwhelmed by secret troubles or a longing for a new beginning, had orchestrated her own vanishing act. Since the call came in about Polly's disappearance from Deep Creek Campground, the case has weighed heavily on me. Bryson City, usually alive with the camaraderie of outdoor enthusiasts, now feels subdued, cloaked in a silence that's hard to shake. Campfire gatherings, once full of laughter and stories, now revolve around a single question. What happened to Polly? In my time as sheriff, I've seen my share of cases, but none have echoed through the community like this. The absence of evidence for theories like abduction or an animal attack only fuels more speculation. Some whisper about the possibility of Polly orchestrating her own disappearance driven by unseen pressures or desires for a new start. With no sign of her, these theories and the collective sense of loss only deepen. Polly was more than a missing person. She was a beloved part of our community fabric. The mystery of her disappearance, set against the backdrop of the Smokies, is a puzzle that's proving difficult to solve. My role demands objectivity and focus on the facts yet I can't help but feel entwined in the community's search for answers and closure. This isn't just another case. It's a quest to restore peace to a community that's lost one of its own. Each theory reflected the desperation and hope of a community grappling with the unknown. Whispers of otherworldly explanations even began to surface, with suggestions of supernatural forces at play in the dense, ancient forests of the Smokies. As the search expanded in scope and scale, the mystery of Polly's disappearance only deepened, casting a long shadow over the Deep Creek campground and the hearts of those who called it home. As the initial shock of Polly Melton's disappearance settled into a persistent, uneasy quiet, attention turned to the fragments of behavior and evidence she left in her wake. The day before she vanished, Polly deviated from her routine in a manner that was both subtle and striking. Her decision to make multiple phone calls from a location she seldom used for such purposes painted a picture of premeditation, or perhaps a silent cry for help. These calls, shrouded in mystery due to the lack of traceable records, became a focal point for speculation. 
Who was on the other end of the line? Was Polly reaching out to someone as part of a plan to start anew? Or were these conversations a lifeline thrown in a moment of distress? Who was she calling, and why keep it a secret from us, her friends? At night, the quiet of the camp was a reminder of her absence. Those calls, were they a sign we all missed? The idea that she might have been silently struggling, or even planning to leave, was haunting. Polly was the life of our group, it's hard to imagine she had troubles she didn't share. With every day that passed without a trace of her, those phone calls became a puzzle we couldn't solve, a piece of the mystery that kept us awake at night. It's the not knowing that's the worst part, the feeling of having missed the chance to help a friend in need. Further adding to the complexity was Polly's mental state. Known to be a private person, Polly had navigated the loss of her mother with a resilience that masked the depths of her sorrow. Yet, beneath the surface, there were whispers of depression, a battle fought quietly and perhaps not entirely overcome. The disappearance of Bob's volume, a medication not prescribed to Polly but within her reach, suggested a turmoil that went deeper than many realized. Was it a coincidence, or did it hint at a desperate attempt to find solace in oblivion? Six months after Polly stepped into the unknown, a new clue emerged, as baffling as it was unexpected. A check, bearing Polly's name, was cashed in Birmingham, Alabama. This city, a thread woven into the tapestry of Polly's past, suddenly became a beacon for those searching for answers. The signature on the check, a mimicry of Polly's own handwriting, suggested an involvement but fell short of conclusive proof. Was Polly alive, orchestrating her disappearance with a precision that left her loved ones grappling in the dark? Or was someone else manipulating the strands of her story, casting shadows over the truth? The cash check did not have a clear narrative and injected a new layer of complexity into the theories surrounding Polly's fate. It stood as a solitary signpost pointing towards a life that might still be lived, or a ruse crafted to mislead. The implications of this financial transaction rippled through the community, reigniting the embers of hope and suspicion in equal measure. In the search for Polly Melton, every clue seemed to deepen the mystery rather than illuminate the path to understanding. The unusual behaviors, the untraceable phone calls, and the volume that vanished all converged around the cash check, leaving those who sought the truth pondering the mysterious twists of fate that could hide a woman from the world or reveal her secrets to those who dared to look closer. Bob Melton, Polly's husband, found himself adrift in a sea of uncertainty, his health and spirit diminished by the weight of her absence. Friends who had shared trails, laughter, and the simple pleasures of campground life now faced the empty space where Polly once stood, her presence irreplaceably void. The fabric of the community, so tightly knit around shared experiences and mutual affection, frayed at the edges, leaving those within it grappling with a loss that extended beyond the physical. The mystery of what happened to Polly Melton remains a question mark hanging over the Smoky Mountains. The story of her disappearance touched not just those who searched the woods and called her name, but also those who hear her story and felt the chill of the unresolved fate. The emotional toll exacted by Polly's vanishing was not measured in days of searching or miles traversed, but in the quiet moments of reflection, the birthdays and anniversaries that passed without her and the haunting realization that some questions may remain forever unanswered. The legacy of Polly's disappearance is a story of love, loss, and the relentless pursuit of truth. If you have any information, no matter how small or seemingly insignificant, you are urged to come forward. In the quest for answers, every piece of the puzzle is crucial. It is through this collective effort that we may yet find the closure so deeply sought, not just for Polly's sake, but for those all touched by her story. On a crisp day late in October of 1963, two adventurous spirits, Helen Mower and Margaret Ivysick, set out to conquer the rugged terrains of Mount Cahaden, the highest peak in Maine. Hailing from Concord, Massachusetts, the duo, seasoned in the art of hiking, embarked on their journey with enthusiasm, choosing the Cathedral Trail for their ascent. 
the morning air was filled with anticipation of the challenges and beauty that lay ahead. As they ascended, the landscape around them transformed. The dense forest canopy gave way to rocky outcroppings, and the path narrowed as they neared the Baxter Peak. It was around 1.30 p.m. when they finally reached the summit, their spirits high from the accomplishment. There, amidst the breathtaking vistas that stretched endlessly before them, they paused to celebrate, sharing a lunch that tasted of triumph. However, as they prepared to descend, an unforeseen tension emerged between the two. The mountain, with its serene beauty, was indifferent to the human narratives unfolding on its slopes. Margaret, driven by a desire for adventure, suggested that they bushwhack directly down the headwall to Chimney Pond. This route, untamed and unmarked, promised a shortcut through the wilderness, a direct path that veered off the beaten track. Helen, on the other hand, felt a surge of apprehension at the thought. She knew the mountain's beauty was matched by its dangers. The unpredictable terrain and the risk of disorientation were too great. Preferring the safety and familiarity of the Dudley Trail, the path they had initially taken, she voiced her concerns. The disagreement between the two friends was profound, touching on the very essence of what it meant to explore. To bushwhack was to embrace the unknown, to confront the wilderness in its rawest form. Yet, to follow the established path was to respect the mountain's power, acknowledging the fine line between adventure and peril. In the end, they chose different paths. Margaret laughed off Helen's warnings. Her decision was made. She would take the mountain on her terms, disappearing into the wilderness with a determination that bordered on defiance. Helen, with a heavy heart, watched her friend venture into the unknown before turning back to the safety of the Dudley Trail. This moment of separation, marked by a mixture of emotions, excitement, worry, and the thrill of the unknown, would later be shrouded in mystery. The decision to part ways, made on a mountain that has witnessed countless stories of human endeavor, set the stage for a tale that would captivate the imagination of many. The mountain, silent and majestic, offered no clues as to what lay ahead, its secrets hidden among the shadows and the light that danced across its ancient face. As twilight began to cast its shadow over Mount Katahdin, the serene atmosphere at Chimney Pond was pierced by a growing sense of unease. Helen Mower, having descended via the familiar path of the Dudley Trail, arrived to find the area missing her friend. The realization that her friend was not there to greet her, as agreed, sent a ripple of worry through Helen's heart. The pond, usually a mirror reflecting the tranquil beauty of the mountain, now seemed to echo her deepening concern. The weather, as if in tune with Helen's anxiety, began to shift. The once clear skies darkened, and a foreboding chill swept through the air, signaling the approach of a storm. Mount Katahdin, known for its sudden and severe weather changes, was living up to its reputation. As Helen called out into the encroaching darkness, her voice seemed small against the vastness of the wilderness. Then, unexpectedly, a response cut through the silence. Margaret's voice, calling for help, carried down from a headwall, an imposing barrier of rock that stood between her and safety. She was trapped, unable to advance or retreat. The urgency in her voice was clear, even from a distance, painting a vivid picture of her predicament. Faced with this dire situation, Helen rushed to the ranger station, where she found Ranger Ralph Heath. Heath, an experienced guardian of the park, listened intently as Helen recounted the events. Despite the worsening weather, which would make any rescue attempt perilous, Heath recognized the gravity of the situation. The mountain, indifferent to the fates of those who dared its paths, was closing in with its storm. Ralph Heath, no stranger to the mountain's nature, felt a deep responsibility for the souls under his watch. His initial hesitation, born from a knowledge of the risks involved, was quickly overshadowed by a resolve to act. The life of a hiker hung in the balance, and in the world of wilderness rescue, timing could mean the difference between life and death. Thus, with determination etched into his features, Heath made the decision to intervene directly. The pending storm, the uncertain terrain, and the fading light would not deter him. 
in that moment, he embodied the spirit of those who serve as stewards of the wild, those who step forward when the wilderness calls, regardless of the potential risks. This unfolding crisis, set against the backdrop of Mount Katahdin's rugged landscape, was more than a test of survival. It was a testament to the bonds formed in the face of adversity, the duty of those tasked with safeguarding nature's domain, and the unpredictable drama that the mountain stages for those who venture onto its slopes. As Helen and Ranger Heath prepared to confront the challenge before them, the mountain awaited, its silence a profound reminder of the mysteries that it held. Under a cloak of gathering clouds and whispering winds, a story of bravery and determination unfolded. Ranger Ralph Heath, standing at the threshold of night and the unknown, made a critical decision to reach out to Margaret, stranded and alone on a treacherous headwall. His voice, a beacon in the darkness, traversed the cold air, advising her to stay put and not move. The promise of help was on the horizon, a sliver of hope in the vast wilderness. Despite the wisdom of waiting for daylight and the strength of numbers, the urgency of the situation pierced Heath's seasoned heart. The mountain, indifferent to the dramas enacted upon its slopes, was a silent observer as Heath prepared for a rescue attempt that defied all the odds. As night enveloped the landscape, at around 11 p.m., he embarked on a solitary journey up the Dudley Trail, a path he knew as well as the back of his hand, yet it now took a new dimension under the veil of darkness and of the incoming storm. The night rescue attempt, fraught with challenges, was a testament to Heath's resolve. The mountain's unpredictable nature, coupled with the absence of light, rendered the path both a physical and psychological maze. Although he could not reach Margaret, his determination led him to pinpoint her exact location, a crucial piece of the puzzle in the desperate search and for her safety. As dawn broke, painting the sky with strokes of light and hope, Heath, undeterred by the night's failures, devised a new plan. At 6.10 a.m., with the first light guiding his steps, he decided to ascend directly up the headwall. This decision, bold and fraught with peril, was driven by a singular focus to provide comfort and reassurance to Margaret. The headwall, a formidable barrier of rock and ice, stood as a silent challenge to Heath's resolve. This daylight rescue effort was more than just a physical endeavor. It was a race against time and the elements. Heath's intention to stabilize and console Margaret until further help could arrive was a beacon of human spirit and resilience. The mountain, a timeless witness to countless tales of courage and loss, watched as one man's determination to save another life pushed him to the limits of his endurance and beyond. In these moments, the bond between rescuer and stranded hiker became a narrative thread woven into the fabric of Mount Kahadin's mystery. The rescue attempts, marked by moments of hope, fear, and unwavering courage, highlighted the profound connection between humans and the natural world. A relationship defined by respect, challenge, and the innate desire to aid those in peril. As Heath climbed, each step was a testament to the depths of human compassion and the indomitable will to make a difference, no matter the odds or the cost. As Ranger Ralph Heath pressed onward, the skies above Mount Kahadin began to brood with a foreboding intensity. Nature, in its untamed and unpredictable majesty, was setting the stage for a dramatic confrontation. A nor'easter, vast and relentless, swept across the landscape with a ferocity that transformed the mountain into an impenetrable fortress of snow, wind, and chilling silence. This sudden turbulence was not just a storm, but a barrier between hope and despair, making any rescue operation not just difficult, but seemingly futile. The world around Heath and Margaret shrank to the immediate and the elemental. Visibility was swallowed whole by the blizzard, erasing the line between earth and sky, leaving only a white void where landmarks once stood. The howling winds became a constant companion, a reminder of the mountain's power to isolate and intimidate even the most seasoned souls. In this whiteout, Heath and Margaret found themselves not just geographically stranded, but suspended in a moment of profound isolation. The storm, in its overwhelming presence, seemed to erase time, reducing the vast wilderness to an intimate theater of human endurance and nature's indomitable will. 
rescue efforts once a beacon of hope were halted, leaving the pair in a limbo dictated by the whims of the storm. The desperation of their situation was palpable, a test of spirit and survival against the backdrop of an indifferent universe. The mountain, shrouded in its winter fury, became a realm of shadows and whispers, where the line between life and the eternal seemed to blur. This was not just a mere physical struggle, but a journey into the heart of mystery itself, where the forces of nature conspired to weave a tale of human vulnerability and resilience. Ralph found Margaret as the storm made its presence felt on the mountain. They took shelter together, bracing against the storm's increasing ferocity. Meanwhile, a ranger sergeant ventured toward Chimney Pond, only to encounter whiteout conditions and gale force winds by the basin. By midday, the accumulation of 18 inches of snow rendered the trailhead inaccessible to jeeps, and the sergeant's clothing froze solid, cracking at the joints due to the severe cold. Hindered by zero visibility and relentless winds, he was compelled to retreat, recognizing the grave peril that Ralph and Margaret faced, now beyond the reach of any aid or rescue. The next day, Warden Supervisor David Priest established what is now known today as an incident command center at Roaring Brook, mobilizing a continuous effort of at least 35 people. Despite their endeavors, the swift snow accumulation hindered any progress. By November 1st, five days after Margaret's predicament began and four days following Ralph's attempt at aid, the consensus was bleak. The rescue teams, having exhausted all options, concluded further attempts and rescue efforts would all be in vain. William Lowell Putnam III, a seasoned mountaineer involved since the onset, voiced on November 3rd his belief that Ralph and Margaret had succumbed to the elements earlier in the week, highlighting the futility of continuing their rescue mission. It wasn't until the following April that Margaret's body was recovered, necessitating the use of chemical salts to thaw the surrounding ice carefully. The autopsy revealed she had succumbed to severe blood loss within hours of her injury. Two weeks later, Ralph's body was discovered 400 feet above Margaret's final resting place and was airlifted from the scene. His autopsy revealed no apparent cause of death, leading to speculation he might have simply succumbed to the cold in his sleep. In the aftermath of this tragedy, the story of Ranger Ralph Heath's unwavering commitment and ultimate sacrifice offers profound reflections on the essence of service, the depths of personal sacrifice, and the enduring mystery of human resilience in the face of nature's unfathomable forces. Ralph Heath's journey from the battlefields of World War II and Korea to the serene yet unpredictable wilderness paints a portrait of a man who found solace and purpose in the guardianship of nature. His decision to venture into the heart of the storm, fully aware of the perilous conditions awaiting him, was not merely an act of duty, but a profound expression of his deep connection to the wilderness he vowed to protect. This act of selflessness, risking his life for another, encapsulates the very essence of sacrifice, a theme that resonates deeply within the silent, towering presence of Mount Katahdin. The legacy of Ralph Heath, etched into the collective memory of the park and its visitors, transcends the mere recounting of his heroic deeds. Annual ceremonies serve as a reminder of the human element inherent in the wilderness, a testament to the values of sacrifice and service that define the spirit of those who watch over our natural landscapes. Yet, as discussion surfaces about discontinuing the tradition of remembrance, we are prompted to reflect on the importance of honoring such sacrifices, lest we forget the cost of safety and preservation in the wild. As we reflect on Ralph Heath's legacy, we are drawn into the mysteries that envelop his final journey, a reminder of the countless stories that remain untold, hidden within the heart of the wild. His sacrifice and service, emblematic of the profound bond between humans and nature, leave us with an enduring lesson about the strength of the human spirit, the value of remembrance, and the ceaseless call of the wilderness that, even in the most daunting moments, reveals the true measure of our courage and compassion. If you found this story as intriguing as I did, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. Your support means the world to us and helps us keep bringing these stories to light. 
We'd love to hear your thoughts and theories on what might have happened to Sandra, so please leave your comments below. And if you really enjoy our free content and want to support our channel further, consider leaving a super comment for any amount. It's a great way to show your appreciation and helps me continue my work on more mysterious content. Again, thank you for being part of this community and for your support. Until next time, keep questioning and keep seeking the truth. Thank you all for watching this video 